The young wizard Harry Potter was conceived in the bored imagination of J.K. Rowling whilst on a delayed train in the last decade of the 20th century. The extraordinary success of the subsequent books, films, games and theme parks owe all to the genius of an author able to beguile millions around the world into following the adventures of the hero in the imaginary world of Hogwarts. Half a century earlier, it was not one, but two authors, friends in fact, who created stunning mythical worlds in which readers could escape the drab realities of post-war Britain. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis were the two friends, The Lord of the Rings and The Tales of Narnia, their fantastical masterpieces populated by orcs, goblins, hobbits, wizards, or children falling through the backs of wardrobes into worlds of snow queens and talking lions. C.S. Lewis is hence best known at large as the creator of brilliant children's stories. But for anyone even remotely interested in theology, he is also known as a serious theologian, with a knack for writing in a prose as clear as the message is profound. He also had the ability to pull Christians together and focus on what we all hold in common across traditions. As a result, he has been embraced by all, and across the spectrum of Christian belief, his name and ideas are endlessly quoted in books published by Christians of all stripes. Amongst his books, none have had such a great impact as mere Christianity. The record of a collection of hugely popular BBC radio talks giving an account of the Christian faith recorded during the Second World War. One of the most famous arguments he uses is that of the liar, lunatic or lord, also referred to as Lewis's trilemma. This is how he puts it. I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic, on the level with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronising nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Now it seems to me obvious that he was neither a lunatic nor a fiend, and consequently, however strange or terrifying or unlikely it may seem, I have to accept the view that he was and is God. He is, of course, right. A man who claims to be God is either mad, bad, or God. There are no other options, certainly not that of a great moral teacher. But maybe it is not that simple. What if he never claimed to be God? What are we to make of the written reports which has him making these claims? Maybe the authors had their reasons to say that he claimed to be God, but in fact, he never did so. These two other answers, he never claimed to be God, or else we can't trust the Gospels, are pretty well all well always how this trilemma is answered by those who can't accept that Jesus was the Son of God. Over time, such doubts as to the trustworthiness of Scripture has led to a split in the popular imagination between the historical Jesus and the Christ of faith. This quest for the historical Jesus has been a great help in deepening our understanding of how the Gospels were edited and written, who they were written for and the cultural context in which they were set. But along with this has often come a level of scepticism completely out of line with that which would be applied to any other historical text of the same period. A couple of excellent books written by biblical scholars, one a Catholic, the other a Protestant, make a strong case that the gospel accounts of the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ are reliable sources. The first is called The Case for Jesus by Brant Petra, and the second is called Can We Trust the Gospels by Peter J. Williams. All that follows is based on blending the insights of these two books. So what do we know about Jesus Christ, and more importantly, how do we know about him? 
The evidence comes overwhelmingly from the testimony of his followers, which we find in the New Testament, but not exclusively. Richard Dawkins' doubts as to Jesus' very existence have abated of late, but it is not uncommon to hear people voice similar doubts. That is when scepticism tips into absurdity. For if we applied such levels of doubt to any other historical figure, we could not be sure of the existence of almost anyone who lived beyond a few centuries ago. Let us start with the evidence for Jesus from outside the Bible. The Roman historian Tacitus wrote the Annals around AD 115 to 117, his account of the history of the Roman Empire from AD 14 to AD 68. He was certainly no friend of the nascent Christian faith, calling it a disease. From his writings, we learn a number of interesting things. First of all, that Christianity had spread far and wide in a remarkably short time. He gives an account of the persecution of Christians in Rome under Nero in AD 64, which by that time had grown in number to become a multido ingens, or a vast multitude. He says, They were covered by wild beast skins and torn to death by dogs, or they were fastened to crosses, and when daylight failed, were burnt to serve as lamps by night. This, remember, was only 30 years after Jesus Christ's death by crucifixion in Judea, a province 2,300 kilometres away. The first obvious question is then, what could have motivated people to accept dreadful species of martyrdom rather than renounce their faith? Just a mythical figure from folklore? and we'll be talking about that theory later. Further evidence comes from Pliny the Younger, writing just a little before Tacitus in AD 109 to 111. Pliny was an aristocratic Roman lawyer who was appointed governor of Pontus, a Roman province now part of modern-day Turkey. Amongst his voluminous correspondence is a letter to the emperor Trajan, asking for advice on how to deal with Christians in his province. Once again, he describes their large number and added how annoying it was that their faith led the locals away from worshipping at the temples of the local Roman deities. He mentions Christians who had renounced the faith 20 years previously, who used to meet together singing to Christ as to a god. The same question for the sceptic arises. If people were worshipping Jesus as a god in the 90s, just 60 years after the events described in the New Testament, then there is a problem. The idea that Christian communities were worshipping a semi-mythical figure conjured up over the generations through the steady accretion of tales grown ever taller in the telling just doesn't stack up. There is just not the time for this Grimm's fairy tale view of the genesis of the Gospels to happen. The final piece of evidence on Jesus, Jesus outside the Bible I want to look at comes from Josephus, a Jewish historian who was part of the rebellion against Roman rule, which ended with the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple in AD 70. Anyone who has been to the Forum in Rome can see the spoils from that campaign carved in Titus's triumphal arch. Josephus was captured several years before this cataclysmic event for the Jewish nation and subsequently became a firm friend of Rome. His book, Jewish Antiquities, is one of the key sources of life in first century Palestine apart from the Bible. In his book he gives details of the stoning to death in AD 62 of James, the leader of the Christian church in Jerusalem. This stoning of a man described as a brother of Jesus confirms the account given in the Bible of the same event. Now again a question for the sceptical. If the most prominent member of the Christian church is attested to be a close family member of Jesus, both in the Bible and in a non-Christian source, how could the Gospel accounts have been left to wander into the land of myth, unchecked by leading members of the Church who were close family members of Jesus? Now, viewing the Gospels in line with the development of folklore dates back to the late 19th century to early 20th century, when scholars started to unpick the development of fairy tales and folk folklore across Europe and felt this was the best way to explain how the Gospels took their final shapes. They are just the product of endlessly repeated oral stories, with threads of truth mixed in with much creative imagination, finally set down in writing by an editor decades, if not over a century, 
from when they originated. According to this theory, the authors of the Gospels were anonymous editors of existing oral traditions who slapped on the names of apostles to give their retelling of the life of Jesus some credibility. As Rudolf Bultmann, a highly influential, a highly influential early 20th century German theologian, theologian, puts it, there is no historical biographical interest in the Gospels. The most important thing we can learn from the Gospels are the insights they give us into the preoccupations of these anonymous editors and the communities they were writing for. Now, over a century on, the confident assertions of this scholarship are now, in their turn, viewed with increasing scepticism. So what do we know for sure about the Gospels? The first thing we know about the Gospels is that there are a lot of early manuscripts around. Whilst our knowledge of almost all ancient literature, philosophy and the lives of the great and the good relies on a tiny number of copies of copies of copies, written occasionally over a millennia after the events, there are thousands of fragments and hundreds of complete copies of the Gospels, written much closer in time to when the original author first put quill to parchment. As you can see in this table, documentary evidence for the Gospels compares highly favourably to other ancient writings. There are more than 5,300 known Greek manuscripts, 10,000 Latin manuscripts and 9,300 early portions of the New Testament dating from the first few centuries of the Christian era. The first complete manuscript is in the Chester Beatty Library in Dublin, housing a manuscript called Papyrus 45, which contains the four Gospels and the Book of Acts. It was found in southern Egypt and probably dates back to the early 200s AD. If you, if you take a trip up to the British Library next to St Pancras Station in London, you can go in and see in a glass case one of two of the oldest copies of the entire New Testament, the Codex Sinaiticus being dated to around AD 325 to AD 450. Finally, one of the oldest fragments of the New Testament is the Rylands Papyrus, covering a few verses of John 18, which dates back to AD 130. To take just one contrasting example of cherished ancient literature, our knowledge of Caesar's Gallic Wars is based on nine copies of the text. The oldest surviving copy written 1,000 years after the original text. Now, none of this is surprising. It is the norm with ancient literature. So why don't we presume that Caesar's Gallic Wars is just folklore, an accretion of myth over time? It's not because of the textual evidence, which, as we can see, is infinitely weaker than that of the New Testament. The key difference is that the Gallic Wars tells of Caesar's invasion of Gaul. It is not the report of a man who people rapidly worshipped as a god, which, if you have a prior commitment against the existence of the supernatural, can never be accepted. That is the key difference. The motivation for the scepticism is the supernatural content, not the quality of the documentary evidence. We'll take a break here. In part two, we will continue to look at why the anonymous Gospels theory lacks credibility and look instead at why evidence from both outside the Gospels and from within the texts point to the Gospels being historical documents which should be taken seriously. <laughs>